I picked for my scripture this morning from Luke 24, verses 38. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you doubt? And why do you doubt arise in your hearts? My talk this morning is what about doubt? And I want to uh, welcome those on the airwaves to, uh, that are joining us this morning. Welcome. And uh, Jimmy Barber is. Dear Father God, we approach you this morning to ask you to heal us of our doubts. To give us the assurance that you are our Father, that you have sent your Son to sacrifice for us, that we might call you Father. Give us the assurance and the comfort that we need to move forward in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two men, on the way to Emmaus, returned to Jerusalem after Jesus had vanished from their sight, and they were telling the disciples about the encounter when Jesus appeared in the midst of them. And the disciples thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus was asking his disciples and the followers that question, and Jesus is asking you that question today. Does doubt have a place in your religion? If you have doubts, does this mean that you have lost your faith? We all have doubts. From time to time. Doubt itself is not sinful. It is not wrong. In fact, doubt sometimes can cause deeper spiritual growth. It's said that doubt falls into three categories. One, there are intellectual Doubts. These are doubts most often raised by people who are not Christians. Am I really a Christian? They wonder, is the Bible really the Word of God? Is Jesus really the Son of God? And did Jesus really rise from the dead after dying on the cross? Then there's two. Number two. Then there are the spiritual doubts. These doubts tend to come from those who think of themselves as Christians. These doubts tend to come from those that wonder, am I really a Christian? Do I really believe what the Bible says? Is God really with me every day of the week? And then why doesn't prayer always work? Why do I always feel guilty? Number three. Lastly, there are what we call the circumstantial doubts. This doubt is the, loud, is the largest because it covers all the problems we have in our daily lives. Then there are all the whys. Why was my child killed? Why did my child die? Tough ones. 
Why did I lose my job and then my house? Why am I sick all the time? These are the questions that tend to lose our faith. And when life hits us between the eyes, it just seems like no one cares about us. Before we are able to fix our doubts, we need to understand the nature of doubts. Many people think that doubt is the opposite of faith. That's not true. Unbelief or the refusal to believe is the opposite of truth, of faith, not doubt. Unbelief is a decision not to believe something, while doubt concerns our inner security or our inner uncertainty. It's not a denial. Some people think that doubt is unforgivable, but again, it's not. We all have doubts about things, even those relating to God, if we're honest about it. God doesn't condemn us for doubting. Biblical characters like Job and David, question, oh, Biblical characters like God, Job and David, questioned God repeatedly, and they were not condemned. God is big enough, and He loves you enough to handle all the doubts you can throw at Him. Many people think that when you are struggling over a problem with God, it is because of a lack of faith. Is this true? Absolutely not. Struggling with God is a sure sign that we have faith. If you never struggle with God, most likely your communion with God is in very poor condition. What does the Bible, what does the Bible say about this? Let's take a look at a man of God who doubted, John the Baptist. Jesus called him the greatest of the prophets. Confused, frustrated by his imprisonment, John said some of his disciples to Jesus with this question. Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Matthew 11, verse 3. John knew who Jesus was. He baptized him. How could he have so much faith at that time and now have doubts? It is no wonder that John, stuck in prison and not knowing if he would ever be released, began to doubt his role in Jesus' life. But at least he knew enough to ask the right question. Are you the Savior or are you not? How does Jesus answer John? Does he rebuke John for his doubts or does he belittle him because he has not enough faith? No. Jesus tells the messengers that John has sent. He says, go back to John and tell him what you are seeing. They list the things that are happening. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached. To them. Matthew 11, 5. They went back to John. And John's heart 
Let's put it at rest. Jesus basically says to them, go back, tell John that in my name, the hurrying people of the world are being completely changed. Kind of like, you know, John, I mean, he doubt who I am, but I have never doubted who he is. He is still my forerunner. I still believe in him. Jesus knew that underneath John's doubts there was genuine faith. And Jesus was saying that doubts and all, John is still my man. Amen. What a reality. You can have that reality also. When I moved up to the Nevada desert, I joined a small outreach called Oasis and was located in a strip mall and a store. And on the front door was glass. It had the following words. Sinners are welcome. It could just as well have said, doubters welcome. If we think a bit on it, this really should be the church's message. If you have doubts, come inside. If you are uncertain, come inside. If you are a skeptic, come inside. If you are searching for the truth, come inside. Doubt has its uses. Deep doubt often comes before even deeper faith. There's a note of caution, however, as doubt can be dangerous even though it is not a sin in itself. It is what you do with doubt that makes the difference between spiritual growth and sinful living. There are a number of ways that help to handle doubt. There's a silver lining to the club. First, admit your doubts. You can't start unless you admit there's something wrong. Admit your doubts and ask for help. That's what John the Baptist did. God is not easily insulted. He can handle your doubts. Your fears, your worries, and your unanswered questions. He's a big God. He runs the universe without any help. Your doubts won't upset him. Tell him your doubts. Cry out and ask for his help. He won't ever ever fight the battle alone. Go to a Christian friend that has strong faith, or an elder, or a pastor. Second, now act on your faith, not your doubts. That's what Noah did when he built the ark. That's what Abraham did when he left Ur and when he was told to sacrifice Isaac. That's what Moses did when he marched through the Red Sea. 
And that's what David did when he stood up to Goliath. That's what Joshua did when he marched seven times around the city of Jericho. We have a song, and the walls came tumbling down. That's what Daniel did when he was thrown into the lion's den. And that's what the three Hebrews did when they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And lastly, that's what Nehemiah did when he was trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the people in the living in the country were trying to make war against him. I have a question. Do you think that these great heroes of faith had their doubts? I'm pretty well delineated. Of course they did. They didn't know in advance how things were going to turn out for them. They took a deep breath, so-called hitched up their pants, tightened their belts, if they had pants back then, and acted on their faith. Whether it was large or whether it was small. And you can do the same thing. God has promised you the faith that you need, whether it's large or small, to do whatever you need to do. Never fear. Third, doubt your doubts, not your faith. Simply put, this means don't throw away your faith and keep your doubts. All of us have doubts at one time or another. Some I imagine spend a lot of time there. All of us go through that trial sooner or later. But when you get stuck in the dark valley of doubts, try to remember these words. Keep walking. Just keep walking. Moving forward using what faith you have that God has given you. Fourth and last. Keep going back to what you know is true. For me, this is the most important part. After considering the sufferings of this life and the perils and the tribulations that were following Christ, Paul triumphantly concludes Romans 8 by declaring, and I quote, you all know this one, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, Amen. which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Romans 8, verses 38 through 39. What I like about what Paul said was that there is nothing we can do that will cause God to desert us. I think there's a lot of people out in this world and I read about the papers that have concluded that they have been deserted. Okay. 
You can desert him. That's true. You can desert God because he will because he always gives us a choice. We can desert we can desert him, but he won't desert us. You would go to Matthew 28, verse 17. Jesus is out in Galilee meeting the disciples after the resurrection. And when they saw him, end quote, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But then it says, but some were doubtful. The first time I read that verse years ago, I remember thinking, how could the disciples doubt what happened to Jesus? They were there when he appeared as if by magic in the upper room. He ate the fish. They were there when doubting Thomas put his fingers in the wounds in Christ's side in his hands. They heard the story of the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. And then they met him face to face in Galilee. But some were doubtful. Doubt is going to trigger us probably all our life. That's what we do with it. God never turns an honest daughter away. Never. God, to come to him with your doubts, your skepticism, your unbelief, your hard questions, and your uncertainties. He welcomes your hardest questions. Always remember, doubt is not a sin. It's what you do with doubt that makes all the difference. Don't let your doubts keep you from Jesus. I ran across a prayer. I have no idea who wrote it, where I found it. You take this to heart. Lord, I'm tired of playing this game I call church. Of pretending to believe while being eaten up with doubt. I'm weary of pious words, proof texts, petty theological debates, and the form of godliness without a power. I want the real thing, Lord. I want you. I dare to make the same request Moses made when he asked you to show him your glory. Amen. I must see you. For who? You really are. Amen. Why should I settle for shadows when you promise to share your very being with me? Thank you for calling me to prayer. I confess I don't know how to pray, how to really touch your heart and to enter into the joy of your fellowship. But I want to. As you did to Peter that night on the lake, beckon me to come to you. And I will. Only teach me to keep my eyes on you as I take the first halting, trembling steps. I must lay hold of you, Lord. And if I am to live or ever hope to know the abundant life you came to give, you must lay hold of me. Here I am. I come with all my liabilities and the fears 
but I come. And as I come, Lord, please make my life a miracle of your love and grace. Amen.